Before I dive right into the 2031 disk drive I purchased, let's take a look at what led up to the 2031 in the first place. Commodore's first disk drive was the 2040, released in 1979. The 2040 was a dual 5.25 inch IEEE 488 drive for use with the PET computer. It was designed during the summer and fall of 1978 when Chuck Peddle left Commodore and went to Apple. John Fagans did the overall 2040 architecture with Jim Kennedy. Glenn Stark was recruited to do the drive controller functions and Scott Patterson wrote the disk operating system. The 3040, released around the same time, was the European version of the 2040. In 1980, Commodore released the 4040 disk drive as the successor to the 2040. The 4040 was nearly identical to the 2040. It was mainly a marketing and production engineering effort, but the 4040 did get an updated DOS 2.0 when they were released, which, among other improvements over the 2040, was the first Commodore DOS that supported relative files. The 2031 disk drive came next. It was Commodore's first single five and a quarter inch floppy drive. It was developed by Glenn Stark, the same Commodore engineer who I mentioned in conjunction with the original 2040, at Commodore's Moore Park Avenue R&D Lab in San Jose, California in the summer of 1980. It was first shown at the National Computer Conference in Anaheim, California in 1980, and it was released to the market in 1981. The 2031 is still an IEEE 488 drive, but the design of the 2031 is what evolved into the 1540 and then 1541 disk drives. Don't be fooled by the different exterior. The 2031 and 1541 are nearly identical drives with the only fundamental difference being that the 2031 is IEEE 488 and the 1541 is IEC. The later 2031 LP or low profile model even came in the same case as a 1541. The 2031 and 1541 are even write compatible, meaning each drive can read disks created by the other. With that history out of the way, let's take a look at the 2031 I purchased. I purchased this 2031 disk drive off eBay and it arrived packed loosely in packing peanuts. Fortunately, no damage seems to have resulted. It probably looks to be in worse condition than it really is. There's obviously something going on with that activity LED there. We'll have a look at that. The top metal case has a small amount of rust on it, but it's straight and it should clean up well. I have no plans to have that refinished. I'm primarily interested in getting this working so I can use it. I'll get started by removing the top case. Typical for vintage computer items, half the case screws are missing. With the top cover removed, you can see how dirty the main logic board is. I'm gonna remove that and clean it. As grimy as it is, visual inspection of the board doesn't reveal any burn marks or other visible damage. I'll give it another look after it's clean, but so far, so good. Uh-oh, missed a screw over there. I'm gonna remove all the socketed chips before I clean the board. This is a good idea regardless, especially with these old single wipe sockets. Reseating the chips can sometimes be a quick fix before you even begin complex diagnostics on a board.
I don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, so it's straight to the kitchen sink I go. I'll use a soft toothbrush and mild dish soap, then rinse it well. I'll use compressed air to get most of the water off and then let the board sit overnight to dry. Here's a before and after image. It cleaned up nicely. With the socketed chips reinserted, I'll hit them with some alcohol and a cotton swab. Next, I can start cleaning the grime from inside the case. This isn't a cosmetic restoration effort, so it doesn't need to be perfect. I really just want to get the heavy, gross stuff taken care of. Some alcohol on a cotton swab to clean the reed right head. I'm doing this for functional rather than cosmetic purposes, but it looks pretty clean already. I want to remove the dried up lubricant from these head rails. In this state, they're acting more like glue than lubricant, and we don't want the stepper motor to have to work any harder than it needs to. With the rails clean, I'll lubricate them with some sewing machine oil. I'm done with the cleanup work, so I'll start on repairs. The fuse holder's missing its cap, so I need to replace that. While I have that apart, I'm going to replace the power connector. This one has RAFA capacitors built in, and when those things fail, they melt and emit extremely acrid smoke. They're before the power switch, so they can fail even when your equipment isn't powered on. I'm not usually the type of fella who likes to tell us what to do, but in this one case, I highly recommend replacing these before they have a chance to fail. The power connector is held in place using rivets. The easiest way to remove them is with a drill. You don't have to drill the entire way through. Just drill through the rivet's head. Here's my new fuse holder and a new power connector that does not have RIFA capacitors built in. I'm going to secure this using screws and nuts rather than rivets. Because the screw holes are countersunk, I'm going to place it on the outside of the case rather than on the inside like it was before. The fuse holder and power connector are mechanically connected, so now it's just a matter of getting them electrically connected. No magic here. Wire them up exactly how they were from the factory.
Now I can insert a fuse and test the transformer. The transformer is an AC step-down transformer. The primary winding steps the AC input voltage down into two smaller AC voltages, approximately 16 volts AC and 9 volts AC. The output voltages are a direct function of the AC input voltage, so they may not be exact. The AC is rectified to DC up on the board and regulated down to 12 volts DC and 5 volts DC. Here, I just want to see output voltages near 16 volts AC and 9 volts AC. Great, the output voltages both look good. I don't know what happened with the activity LED here. I properly connected it and the original LED isn't working, so I'm gonna replace it. I cut out all that footage to keep things moving in the video though. You can use solderless butt connectors to splice wires. I prefer solder and heat shrink tubing, but you do whatever you're comfortable with. I thought I had some spare red LEDs on hand, but I must have used them on something else. I'll use a green one so I don't have to wait on an order. I tested the transformer, but not the rectifiers or voltage regulators. I'm going to throw caution to the wind and do a quick smoke test. All good. The drive motor spun up, the activity light came on and went off. On to the final test, connecting it to a computer and using it. The first thing I'm going to try to test is initializing a floppy disk.
Looks like that worked. I'm going to load the directory to see. Looks good. Now I'll save a program and try to load it back. It looks like this 2031 is in good working condition. I'll put the case top back on and put it back in service. I touched briefly on how the 2031 and 1541 are right compatible. The details of that, along with the compatibility with the 4040 and other drives, is interesting from a technical perspective. If folks are interested, I may do a future video that goes into those details. For now, I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe even learned something. I'll see you next time.